And so just opening here on our docs on controls, um, you know, if nothing on this call makes sense at all, if I lose you somewhere along the way, uh, this is the place to be, docs.kuma.io slash guides slash controls, or just come over here and, you know, in the search bar and find it. Um, but the main idea of controls, we do have this video up here that has a basic explainer. Um, but the main idea is that you can put buttons on your map, um, you can put labels, you can put drop downs, you can put all kinds of things so that people can, <clears throat> so that people can sort of manipulate what they are seeing. Um, I'm just gonna pull in a live example here so you can see what that means. So uh, on the left here, I have a bunch of controls. These are all filter controls with drop downs. <laughs> Um, so right now I'm just going to filter these elements based on what tags they have. They can have one of these six tags. They can have one or more of these six tags. Um, so I'm just going to filter to show me anyone that has this one. You see that shrunk a little bit. Uh, I think it'll be a little bit more dramatic if I do by organization type. Let's just pick uh, local government agency. So you can see um, just with a filter control with this big tangled mess of a map, imagine yourself being a first time reader of a map like this. Uh, you have no clue what you're looking at. You don't know how to interact with it. Um, but if you are a person who's maybe working for a local government agency and you're interested in seeing that kind of organization, uh, it's just a couple clicks here to get you down to that really um, niche view that you could be looking for. Uh, and just seeing the connections between, uh, just to explain, these are all organizations in the Baltimore area and these are the relationships between them. Um, so if you're kind of in the audience trying to read through this data, you can come in, pick from one of these options and filter it down to that. Um, filter is just one of many different kinds of controls, uh, but I think it's a good one usually to start off with to just kind of show the power, um, show the ease of use. Because the alternative here, if you've messed around with Kumu's settings panel, is to come in here, open up the filter settings. Um, you know, maybe I'll exclude all of this stuff and then I'll come down here and I want to include, where is that organization type field? Here it is. Anything where the organization type is a local government agency. I'll use that one and now they come back into view. Um, so even just that short walkthrough, um, I'm already up to, I don't know, 10, 15 clicks maybe to get there. And somebody who is a new user to Kumu or is in your readership audience, um, they're going to have absolutely no idea where to come in this menu and how to kind of put this stuff together. Um, so controls are just a nice shortcut for them to be able to, be, to do that stuff on their own. So um, I think from there, I'll walk through the different kinds of controls. That's fine, yes. And so the most, there's some basic ones here up at the top. Yeah, the it's taking a five minute break, Lish. Options. Oh, five six. minute review. Somebody is on you here. Um, so with the title control, I think I don't have any live examples of this one, but I can add some in here. Um, the most basic way to add any controls, by the way, is to come in here. Um, you have your settings panel here, go to more options, add custom controls. And then you have a couple different options here. These are just some common, um, common use cases, common defaults that we find that people use. So we've made them easily accessible here. Um, I think you'll see as we get through, uh, how kind of complex the control settings can get as you custom tailor them for individual cases. Um, that's a little bit of the reason behind why we haven't packed all of the different possible options and all of the possible settings into this menu. Um, cause we also do want to keep this kind of clear and not overwhelming for maybe somebody who just needs a basic use case. Um, so this filter elements by field, I can put that in a region. I can put that on the top. Um, you can see there's no values in element type, but if I change that field to organization type, so there we go. Um, almost got some feedback here. Um, so you see, I've got now options across the top buttons when you have more than, you know, maybe three, four, depending on the length, this one's really long. Um, but if you see it start to overflow like this, it's usually best to go with a drop down instead. It looks a little cleaner. And so now I have that control and I can use the same, this is essentially the same exact thing that I have over here. This one just has maybe some custom 
styling and it's over here on the, on the left by default. Um, but to add basic controls like that, and we can actually see, we'll prove that this one works. Um, to add simple controls like this, it's, it's just as easy as coming in here, clicking around a little bit with the control builder. Um, to get to some of these other types, like the title control, um, where you can add a title on the top of your map. Um, some of these other ones are not built in here as options. Um, but those ones you can do in the advanced editor. So I think I'll dive into this a little bit, maybe not just yet. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to cover before I dive into the advanced editor. Alex, a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is from a user perspective. It's just changing their view of the map in the moment, but not changing uh, the, it's not uh, updating the map. It's, it's exactly, not, yeah. it's not, um, you're not saving those changes. Precisely, yeah, yeah. So in general, anybody who's viewing a Kumu map, unless they have, unless they're the owner of this project, or if you open up the settings here and check members, unless they have a Kumu username and they're listed here, uh, there's no way they can save any of the settings. Um, so it would just be as a reader kind of manipulating this. And even, you know, you can see I've got, if I apply some of this, well, maybe I'll actually get rid of that one. So I'll get back to my save view. Um, so this is the normal version of this view. If I come in here and filter, uh, and then I reload the page, um, you'll see that everything will just go back to normal. And this also isn't like a, a real time thing. It's not like when two people are viewing the map from different sides of the world and one of them is filtering, that won't affect what the other person is seeing either. This is all kind of independently contained on each person's version of it. Um, so you can imagine now, like I was one person before manipulating it a bit. And now imagine that I'm another person in another location. I've just loaded up a fresh copy of this map and you can see that none of those settings are in. So um, you as the author of a Kumu map will provide these tools so that people can manipulate it, but all that manipulation does only happen um, on their end. It doesn't get saved back. Um, so uh, I, think, I think I'll dive into the advanced editor stuff now and show you maybe how to set up some of these things. You know, A lot actually, of these codes- Alex, one yeah. second. Maybe I misunderstood. Uh, I, Obviously, if, if the dropdowns already exist, you know, no changes. But I meant if they um, come in and do exactly that right there, one. create their yeah. own custom controls or, or use the control mm -hmm. uh, mechanism, they yeah. can do that. They can create their own dropdowns. They could, yeah. They could create their own dropdowns if they knew what they were doing uh, and wanted to come in here. But you can see down here I have a save and a revert option. And you um, if, yeah, if I'm just a random person viewing this and I don't have edit access or I'm not the owner or anything like that, uh, I'll still see the revert so that I can play around with different settings and then revert right. to. Uh, so, so you're not advocating that people do this. You're, you're at this point, you're just saying this is how you can build controls into your map for your user. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is Got much it. more of a tool in general, the way we kind of try to design Kumu is so that you as the author, um, know that this settings panel exists and you have some knowledge and expertise in how to navigate here. Um, but this is not something that we envision like an end reader. It used to be the case okay. that if an end reader wanted to kind of come in and, and change the view in any sort of way, change what they were looking at, um, and the author didn't do it, they would have to come into this kind of bare metal settings panel. Um, but controls have kind of abstracted that away so that you know, you can even see that I've used controls actually to hide the settings button. It's usually here. Um, I wonder if I can pull that up. I have that in a different place in the source code, but um, I've hidden it here too. This one though, okay, so this one has a settings button. Um, you can use controls to hide the settings button. People will always be able to open. So on here, I'm opening the settings panel just by pressing T on my keyboard. Um, uh -huh. But I, I do find it's nice uh, just to kind of hide that for, because you can imagine a first time reader, never seen this kind of diagram. Then they come in here in the settings panel. Maybe they see this big code pile. Maybe they see even this interface and they you know, will just get maybe overwhelmed by it and intimidated by it. Um, so it's kind of a nice little trick I like is to hide that settings panel using controls. I can definitely show um, how to do that, I think, later on. Um, 
But I suppose that's a good thing to mention as well, is that all these things that you see, the search bar up here, uh, the Zoom toolbar, if I click on one of these, you'll see the focus toolbar comes out. Those are under the hood actually just controls. Even the legend down here is a control. Um, so you can remove these, reposition these. If I wanted these all to be on the left side and move all this stuff to the right, I could do that using controls. Um, if I wanted to hide the legend or move the legend over here, I could do that using controls as well. Um, so it's pretty flexible. I think there's not many cases where you'll need to do that. Um, but it is nice to know that you can. We actually, in the docs, it's on that main page in controls. And if you scroll down, there's a section on built-in controls. So it's kind of right there at the bottom. Um, and it'll show you, give you some code snippets that you can copy to kind of mess around with that. We also, if I remember correctly, have a frequently asked questions, yeah, about how to hide the settings button. Because um, this is a really common one. <clears throat> I'll do this for almost every map that I'm gonna be presenting in some way, shape or form, I like to hide the settings button. Um, and a lot of people like to do that as well. So I just wrote a little frequently asked question doc about that. Um, basically, you would just have to copy paste this anywhere into your advanced editor and you'd be ready to go. Um, so I'll pull back up that top level document here. And uh, I'll jump into the advanced editor. So you can see here, um, I'm actually doing some import stuff. That's a different Kumu feature, but I will go to this view right here, which is controls. Basically, I'm importing code from other views to get it in here, just kind of keep things clean there. Um, but I'll pull up the controls view. So this is kind of where I set up my controls. I don't have any of the coloring or styling on here because um, I wasn't so concerned about that in this area. Um, but I will open up, so you see my code here is all just a long list. It's all inside of one block here. And that block starts with controls. So whenever you're coding controls, it's always gonna start with this. Um, and I might even just clear all this out so we can start from scratch. Um, so you see I've got a blank map, I've got my default stuff, I got my settings button back. Um, so if I do something like at controls, and then I give it a region, this is kind of the basic format. You start with controls, and then you make a block for the region that you want to work in. So top would be top right here in the middle. Um, and then I can do something like filter. So this third level down is where you define what kind of control you're going to be working with. And I'm going to do by, oops, spelled that wrong, uh, organization type as drop down. And you should see now I have this, these options here. I can click them to bring stuff into the map. Um, and another common setting that you'll see, so as you noticed, everything kind of disappeared here as soon as I typed in filter. That's due to a setting called default. Um, and if I set this back to show all, then everything will pop back into view, all my elements and connections. Um, so just to pause here, I'm already starting to get into these different kind of properties and you might think like, well, this is kind of magical. How do you even know that this stuff exists? Um, these are mentioned throughout the docs here, but the number one place to go to kind of figure out all the different coding properties that are available is this controls reference. Um, so we have some, I've kind of grouped this into two sections. One is for static controls, which I describe here is they're not, you know, they're not really meant for interaction. They're more just to put information on the page, like a title control is a great example. Um, I'm actually just gonna copy paste this. Well, I'll copy paste, I'll keep that on the top. Um, let's paste this one in. So you see, this is just a title. There's no real interaction here. I'm just meant to read it and sort of acknowledge that it's there. Um, so that is kind of the first category of static controls. You can't really do anything with them and they have a certain set of properties that can apply to them. It's mostly just cosmetic stuff like color. Um, like if I show you um, color here, if I change that to blue, this will change to blue. Um, so yeah, for static controls, most of the properties are all just kind of aesthetic cosmetic stuff. Um, changes that you can make to font family, 
um, et cetera. And in each of these ones, you can hover over the information here. It'll kind of give you some indication of what kind of value you can put in there. Uh, the interactive ones are where it gets a bit more advanced. So you'll notice there's a lot of repeats here, like color, background color, font family. Um, pretty much for all of the interactive controls, you can do the same kind of stuff that you do with the static. So if I copy paste this color blue and put it in here, you can see that my font uh, here for my interactive control has now changed to blue. Uh, the drop down remains unchanged. This doesn't get styled, um, but you can style this text that does get placed on the map there. Um, but so here you can see uh, I've got by and as. So by defines the field to filter, showcase, or cluster by. And so right here I have by organization type. Um, and even this kind of stuff is pretty intuitive to read. Um, you can say filter by organization type as dropdown. That's almost like a natural language sentence. Um, so as long as you're kind of typing in the right order, you should more or less be able to kind of read your way right through your code. Um, this stuff like default, I think is a little bit maybe trickier to discover, but that one is documented here too. So you can see I've got a bunch of options there. Um, with all of this kind of stuff, it's best to just sort of play around and experiment. Um, it took me a really long time, I think, to learn how to code all of this stuff together and what each different setting does. Um, I often find myself coming back here if I don't remember what the options are for one of these properties. And I've been doing this for, you know, I've been maybe working in the advanced editor, um, probably spending like 80% of my time in the advanced editor for like the past four years now of my Kuma work. And I still come back to these reference documents. So I think, you know, it's fine not to have the expectation that you're going to become a complete savant of all the different properties here. And, you know, somebody says, oh, I want to do multiple. What are the different options for that? And you can automatically list them off the top of your head. Um, I think it's best to just kind of bookmark these guides and come back to them when you need them. Um, but there's, you know, all kinds of little options here like default. I'll pick another one. Uh, let's say you want to change this placeholder text. You can use a property here called placeholder. And I can do something a little bit more user friendly like this. Um, I can say show hide by organization type. Maybe I'll even put a dot, dot, dot there. Um, so you can imagine as a new user, this is going to be a lot clearer. Show high by organization type. You click a drop down. That's a lot clearer than just having something that says organization type. I don't really know what that does or what it's there for, or what it's intended to do. Um, so there's all kinds of just little properties like that. Some of them are going to be cosmetic and some of them are going to affect the core functionality like the default one, for example. Um, I think the other one I want to touch on, and it's a good example now that we have in front of us, is the target property. Um, so pretty much when you're doing any filter, showcase, or cluster, or tag timeline control, these are kind of some of the four most common that we see people using for interactive stuff. The target property is going to be really important. So the target property sets, um, tells the control what it is allowed to touch, basically, and what it's not allowed to touch. So right now I have no target property set, which means this filter proper, this filter control is gonna to touch everything. It's gonna apply my filter rules to everything. Um, so you can see now that I have a organization type selected, all my connections are gone because none of my connections have organization types that just didn't make sense in my data set. It only makes sense for the elements. Um, and I think in this view, I would want to have the connections visible. Like I want somebody who's interested in local government agencies to be able to come in here, filter down to that, but still see the relationships between them. So you can maybe just kind of navigate and draw insight from that information. So what I would do here is use the target property. And instead of just leaving it blank like this, um, I would choose, I say, I only want this to apply to elements. Uh, this is a good one to remember. This, just the simple line right here is something you'll use on um, probably most of your controls. This is something that I use on almost all of mine. Um, and you can see now that all my connections are back into view. And if I show hide and I pick local government agency again, I scroll in, my connections are here because now my filter knows based on that target property, don't touch the connections, leave them in no matter what, um, and just filter down the elements. Uh, and so this is more of a view that I would want to send to a reader 
uh, and I would kind of feel confident that they could look at this and draw some insight from it. Um, so I think I'm gonna pause right there. Uh, I've sort of run through the basics of controls and the basics of the advanced editor structure in general, where you start here with controls, you move into a region, and you start just kind of defining uh, the types, and then you define the different properties um, that you want to sort of customize those types. Um, maybe I'll even, just before I pause, I'll add one in here. Um, so you can see, I will, let's do this one by tags. Um, and I'll keep that one as a drop down too. Um, so this one's on the bottom and you can see that one is working. It's filtering out stuff if it doesn't have those tags. Um, and if you switch over to your advanced editor, you can see that it's added automatically a new region for me and it's defined my filter. You can see with these ones, we actually define target element as a default. Um, Alex, we, I'm not seeing yeah. any change on their screen. No, I don't uh, know. Mate, I'll probably have to reset. <laughs> this happens. That's sometime. correct. I also have no update on the screen. And it, so the last thing that we saw live was when you put in the target. Okay. How about now? Is it, can you see me scrolling in and out here? No. Not up yet. No, nope, still frozen. Started. I'll stop the share for now. Yeah, this happens every once in a while with Zoom. I think you share long enough and it kind of just freezes on one frame. Let's see if I can get that started again. Still black screen. Still black screen, huh? I, I have a, my screen is, I see your, I see your stuff from before. It's not black, uh -huh. but, but it's frozen. Okay. Wouldn't be surprised if it was an internet connection thing too. Sometimes it just won't upload. All right, I'll try and stop the share one more time. Well, I suppose while we're kind of waiting for this to come back, um, did anything, any questions for anyone? Any thoughts that they want to share? I, I have a question. This is Kamal. Um, I saw that you had like a, the drop down on the left. When the, the first example you showed, there was uh, multiple drop downs mm -hmm. um, above each other or below. And then yep. the title. I'm curious to get access to how you did that as well. Yeah, yeah. I will pull up the uh, source code for that so that we can dig in. Um, Still frozen. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. I've never had that happen with Zoom, but I never use webinar. Yeah, it's been happening to me um, kind of consistently over the past three weeks, maybe, where I'll be screen sharing. Um, and it just sort of cuts out, freezes on one screen. And then I talk for 10 minutes and nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. Can you have multiple uh, filters within one control block? Yes, definitely. And actually something that I have been meaning to write some clearer documentation on is how that combines. So uh, with filter, if you have more than one filter control in a block, they're going to always combine with and logic. So if I have, you know, like filter by tags, only elements that have this tag, and then I have a separate one that says filter by organization type, only organizations with this type. Those are going to combine so that your final result is only the elements that have the tag you picked and also the organization type that you picked as opposed to one or the other. Um, I think showcase controls work the opposite way um, where if I picked a tag and I picked an organization type, it would showcase uh, any elements that have either one of those, either the tag or the organization type. So I think um, we're going to at least get some clear documentation written up so that you have some place to go to figure out, um, you know, how that stuff works together. And if not, maybe look back into the sort of code and logic behind that and see if we can kind of make it customizable for you uh, so that you can choose whether you want to combine with and or or, um, or you can, you know, at least have some better consistency in how that works in general. Your screen is live now. It is live, awesome.
I have a question also. When I put um, uh, filters up in the upper left corner, it, it, it obscures the search. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna show you just now how I, how I accomplished this to get the search bar. Um, Cause I'm using this top left region. So uh, once Kumu sees that I have something in the top left here. So if I omitted, you can see right here that this is kind of the trick. You just put search right at the top. If I omit this and I'm using the top left region, um, Kumu by default has, I can even pull up that default code again. Uh, and if my screen does freeze at any time, you know, interrupt me again so that I know not to keep plowing forward. Um, yeah, so right here, all the default settings. This is kind of what Kumu is running under the hood. It's even if it's hidden from you, in the top left, it has search. So if I put stuff in the top left and I don't include search, it will override that remove it, um, which is useful when you do want to override search or maybe move search somewhere else. But when you're just trying to keep it in, it's uh, can be kind of counterintuitive. Um, so if I just add that back into the top left, then I close this. You can see my search comes back and can still use search normally. And I will also have all these other ones listed underneath it. So to also answer the question about um, combining them, listing them like this. Uh, you can see already it's having this behavior here, but Kumu, when you put multiple con uh, controls in one region, so you can see here I have a bunch. I've got a search, a text, a filter, a bunch of different filter ones. Um, even further down, I've got cluster. So I've got all kinds of controls going on here. Here's the bottom, here's the end of this top left region. So all inside of this top left region, Anytime you have this in Kumu where you have one region and then a bunch of stuff inside of it, it's going to just stack them vertically. So if I change this to top, um, you can see it moves search to the middle, stacks everything vertically right in the middle. Um, this obviously doesn't look good because now it's obscuring the main readable portion of the map. Um, but just to show you that that's how it works in general. Um, and that's the same principle that I use here to put search uh, back on the top. Uh, and then, and I'll show actually now some, some control combining. So I'll do advocate for the local environment and I'll do that local government agency one again. Um, zoom fit here. So we've got just a few here. If I remove one of these, it pops some back into view. So you can see that those are combining. It means that they have to meet both of these conditions. And probably if I select a bunch of these, yeah, I'll eventually be left with one or, or nothing on here. Um, so that's another really interesting way. Um, you know, let, let's say somebody comes in here, they're passionate about one of these kind of different tags, um, one of these different sort of aspects of environmental stewardship is what it is for this specific map. Um, and then they want to see how different organization types engage in that. Um, it's a cool way for them to sort of mix and match what they are working with, what they're looking at. Um, and so I'll come through here, see if I have any cool examples of some stuff that I'm doing. Um, in general, you can see a lot of these are using the target property. Um, the target property takes a selector. So um, you can kind of get by with copy pasting a lot of different examples from other people like this one, for example. Uh, means that I'm targeting any element with a blank element type. Um, but definitely to get into really advanced use cases for that, you will need to go to the selectors doc here. Um, but I think even without like a really thorough knowledge, this is you know one of the longest guides I think that we have written. Um, and another, I think one of the most unique and powerful features in Kumbu. But even if you're not a complete expert on how to use selectors, I think you can go really far um, with controls and customizing them. Um, you can see I've got some cosmetic stuff here with font size and font weight. I've got some margin stuff going on here. When I'm stacking controls vertically, I like to have some, some margin rules going on where the margin will just kind of like give space between them. So you can see there's a little bit of space separating these because they're just separate um, functionalities. This one is a connection filter that I'm using to just pretty much toggle on or off all connections of a certain type. And then there's another margin rule giving this white space here. 
And then down here, I have a cluster control. I'll show you that, how that works because we've mostly been looking at filter controls. Um, so with a cluster control, I can pick any one of these. Let's say I want to cluster by organizational focus. And it's going to apply Kuma's clustering feature. This gets pretty tangled, looks like. So I'll just pick one of these and focus on it. Um, so this is a cool way to allow people to kind of draw their own new connections based on the data that you set up. Uh, I'll show you what that one looks like in the code. Yeah, clustering in particular, when, when you get kind of heavy animations like this with zoom, it tends to slow things down. Um, so here's that one. Uh, this one has another interesting little syntax that I'll touch on in a second. Um, but cluster, very similar to filter. Cluster as dropdown. Um, I don't have a, a by value in here, and I'll show why in just a second. Like this one says filter by budget category as dropdown. This one just skips the by and goes straight to as dropdown. Um, this multiple thing means that I can't, it's not allowing me to select more than one option. Uh, I can only select one. Got some cosmetic stuff going on here. And then this options thing. So um, the, you, there's kind of two ways, like if you think about it as a drop down, there's two ways to define what are all the available options that people can pick from. Um, you can see in this tags one, my options are generated automatically because I've used filter by tags. So whenever you use that by property and set it to a field, Kumu is automatically going to generate all your options based on all the possible values for that field. Um, but if you need something a little bit more custom, maybe let's say you wanted to exclude some of these or you wanted to tweak how some of these work, um, you can define your own custom options um, using this option syntax and removing the buy. So you skip the buy up in this top section and then here um, the options are a little bit different for each one. I'm not going to dive too deep into this because it's pretty thoroughly um, documented here somewhere. Yeah, so this one shows you kind of like how to write out this option syntax. Um, but I'll just walk through how one of these works. So I start with an option block. This is inside of my cluster block. Um, and the, cl the value, it's going to say cluster my elements by the tags. And then this thing just assigns the element type of tag to any of those. Uh, new elements and then the label is tags. So how that translates over here is that I connect by I've got my label here for that control for that control option, which is tags. I can pick that. I'm going to get rid of the other social relationship question connections here. Um, so I've picked that option. It's applied my clustering. All these elements are clustered by the tags. And then if I just focus in on one of these, I'm going to open up the profile for that. You can see that it has the element type tag. Um, so definitely, I think to kind of get mastery over these controls and how they work, uh, it's sort of a prerequisite to sort of understand what clustering is all about. Um, maybe how to build some of these advanced rules. So mm -hmm. I think the options syntax is uh, it's not something I use often. You can see out of all of these filters, all of all of these controls that I've put in, I think just two of them use that options thing. So it's really only for like advanced cases where you really need some custom treatment of how that works that you have to have this more um, kind of expert knowledge of, uh, of how these different features work and how to combine them, how to write these kind of selectors. Um, but again, you can get really far um, just starting with this controls builder down here you can get even farther having just the basic idea of how to use some of these properties. Uh, and then it's not until they're really custom cases. And often, you know, when people have custom cases like this, they'll just come to us um, for help. And we're happy to always to kind of help you code these things up. If you have uh, like a vision in mind of what you want the map to look like and how you want it to work, uh, but you're not quite sure of kind of the funky code that should get you there. Um, we've done we slice and dice these controls in all kinds of different ways. So we have a bunch of tricks up our sleeves. Um, and maybe I'll touch on this one, this SNA dashboard. This is a cool one. 
you can see down here, it's calculating different social network analysis metrics for the whole group of elements that I have on the map. Um, so there's a bunch of different cool, we actually consider that one a, a static one because you can't click on it and make anything happen. So the properties that affect that one would be here in the static controls. Um, but we do have for every individual type of control, we have a document with you know a little bit of information about how it looks, always expanding on kind of these screenshots, adding more, um, and then some sample code. With most of this, you can just come into the doc, uh, copy anything you see, and just pop it into any map, and you'll be able to start customizing from there uh, and playing around with it. I'm gonna clear out some of the stuff. I'll pause there too, because I think I just covered a lot of different uh, maybe more like intermediate advanced uh, topics in, in the code here. See if anyone has any questions. It's a little bit, a little bit fuzzy there. I didn't quite catch that question. Maybe throw it in the chat. Uh, this is Kamal. Um, do you have, uh, you know, how you talk to like the people that are on this map, like how you help them get over the complexity of this? Do you, is there, is there a way, is there a place for us to go to, to learn about that? Uh, you mean talking to the readers themselves, the end readers? Yes. Yeah. So I think um, that's an area that I'm really interested in expanding in in the near future. I just put up the other day a video tutorial. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Um, it's going to be in quick tips. Mm, quick tips. And so the video I put up just recently was how can I make my network map more readable? I want to work on a system map version of this as well. Um, but in here, it doesn't quite have um, you know, techniques for talking to people about the complexity, but it has some techniques for how to reduce the complexity as much as possible so that there's less that you have to talk about, that there's less that you have to teach them. Because um, there are kind of technical tips and tricks inside of Kuma that you can use that I often use on my maps that just kind of reduce that mental overhead. Um, I think the, that's kind of like the, the blessing and the curse of Kumu is that you can create these incredibly complex maps um, that are really powerful and have insights buried inside of them. And then the curse, of course, is that you have to kind of teach people how to read into that, um, how to get used to this format, how to interact with it, and how to draw out those insights. Um, because if you can't kind of complete that final step, then as nice as this looks and as cool as it is, it's no different than just like a, a spreadsheet that's opaque and boring to look at. Um, so it's kind of like this is, we think of the Kumu map itself as kind of an intermediate step. You start with your spreadsheet, maybe it's dense, not readable. You get to a Kumu map, which looks like there's some promise here, but still there's some density, there's some, there's some trickiness in terms of reading it. Uh, so that final piece of coaching people how to read it, making, you know, giving you as, as much of a head start as possible so that you're not completely starting from ground zero with everyone. Um, that's kind of where, where we're exploring right now with our new guides and our new video tutorials. Um, That's great. I, I use the left panel to give them navigation tips, but my left yeah. panel's getting <laughs> yeah. thicker and thicker. So yeah. maybe I'm going to start putting links out to mm -hmm. video tutorials or little Google Docs. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll show you guys the one that I use actually right now. Um, uh, I've got a good example of it here using this exact same map. Um, so in this, I have a, a presentation. This is kind of the source map that we've been looking at, but I do have this wrapped up into a Kumu presentation as well. Um, and although I can see your question in the chat, I'll, I'll touch on that right after this one. Um, so let's see if we can load this up. This is another thing that seems to take a long time when you're screen sharing, have a video call going. Okay, there we go. So I will click through, that's my intro slide. Um, 
click through and the next one here. Yeah, so this is my kind of like default list of instructions that I like to give people. Um, I might actually just copy paste this whole thing and throw it into um, a guide that we can publish up here so that maybe people can copy this and use it in their own maps. But yeah, it gets to a pretty long list of, you know, once you have controls here that you want to explain to people how to use, um, it gets kind of difficult. That's why it's another thing that I like about presentations that you can kind of break that up across multiple slides. Um, like here, I have just a slide for basic interaction. You can see I've even hidden the controls. They're not here at all. Uh, and then on the next slide is when I bring them in and I can just sort of dedicate an entire sidebar here to explaining how to use these and what they do. Um, so yeah, definitely. The, the more the more features you add, the more you have to teach, but um, I think it does benefit the end reader in the end. And so all those questions that you put in here, when you cluster by various options, the SNA metrics, are they regenerated or are they not regenerated? That one, I actually don't remember off the top of my head, so let's check. Um, right now, I'm pretty sure filter does regenerate that, so let's see, I've got 147 elements here. And if I click here, yeah, that bumps that down to 100. Um, so the so same should be true if I So the metrics are working on whatever you've selected. And exactly. Filtered. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they definitely apply to whatever you filtered by. Um, uh, and we're going to test to see if they do a connection. So now I've got zero connections here. And let's see if I cluster by tags. Let's see what happens to the SNA metrics. Okay, yeah, so they do update. So I've got my element count bumped up here because I got new elements drawn for those tags. Uh, I've got a bunch of connections going on and new new metrics updated. Um, so yeah, in, so general, in this case, these, the connections that we're looking at are amongst the the elements that are uh, attached to that cluster. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So these these connections, rather than being from organization to organization. Um, and that data, I think, just to give you some more background, that was gathered with a survey where they asked a bunch of organizations, you know, who they're connected to, how, what those connections are all about. Um, these ones are just showing with the clustering feature, just showing, you know, Hampstead Hill Association is connected to these tags. And it's got the elements drawn for those tags. So but that's are the metrics kind of looking at those connections to the cluster, yes. or are they looking to the connections between themselves? Yeah, so the, right now they're looking at those connections between the cluster because I have those oh. social relationship connections filtered out. If I bring those back in, this is going to be an absolutely unintelligible mass of connections now, but you can see that we've got a bunch more added down here. Um, so to control the order, Jim's got a question here in the chat about how do you control the order of the dropdown? Um, you control the order of the dropdown with this option syntax. So, well, I think there's actually two ways to do it. Um, one is to use this option syntax. So if I put these in this order, uh, this is the order they're gonna go in. Normally it would default by be alphabetical, um, but you can see this is not alphabetical. I've got communication methods above that. I've got tags and it's respecting, it's respecting my order that I defined in the option syntax. Um, and this order was actually really deliberate. Um, because for this for this project, these are kind of ordered in hierarchically based on what the most important data is. So the tags are the most important field that we wanted people to know about these elements. So we put that one at the top. Down at the bottom, budget category was the least important. Um, so in those cases, you will want to kind of uh, customize this order. I think you can also do that. Let's see if I can um, do that using a property in here called only. Uh, this defines um, if you are filtering by a field and you only want certain options to be included, you can do this. Um, so I can say advocate for the local environment. I think that's what that option was. I have to look into some of these. Um, so you can see now I only have that one defined. And if I add another option here, um, my non-alphabetical option, uh, list that out. 
So you can see now it's no longer listed alphabetically. Uh, it's listed in my custom order. So that's kind of like a workaround. So, you know, you can imagine if you actually do want all of your tags to be included, um, you can use the only property, not because you only want some of them, but because you want them in a specific order. So you can use this only property to put them in a specific order. Um, I'm gonna make a note of that actually. That's a really good topic for a frequently asked question, I think. Um, it's a useful trick that I use from time to time. Uh, and looks like we have some more questions in the chat. Can you filter on clusters? Yes, you definitely can. This is something that people that trips people up actually sometimes. Um, and going back to why I have this target set up as target element type equals nothing, um, because my base elements here have no element type. I'll open up one of these profiles just to show there's no element type here. Um, but <clears throat> my tags, uh, when I have down here, cluster by tags as tag, that gives them the element type tag, as I showed you a little bit earlier in the call here. Um, and now when I, um, when I filter on these things, normally if I pick this one and I didn't have that target set up that way, well, I'll, sh I'll turn it off and we can actually see how it works. Um, so let's just say I have, where is that one? So here's my tags filter. If I'm just targeting elements in general, I don't care what the elements are, I just want to target all of them. Um, and zoom this back out. Now if I pick tags, it's going to hide my cluster elements because my cluster elements don't have those tags. Um, so that, yes, the short answer is yes, filters do apply to cluster elements. Um, and uh, that's a little trick as well that I just showed you for how to make that not happen. It's just come in here and make this something more specific so that you can exclude those cluster elements from your filters. Um, and again, that, that gets into more of like a maybe intermediate advanced use case of controls um, and target is when you get into those kind of sticky uh, situations where you see something not quite working the way you wanted it to work, um, more often than not, tweaking the target property to you know, narrow down or expand what your control is working on. Actually, although I remember we just had a case like that, um, I was scratching my head on it forever and then it turned out to be just a really simple change to the target property and then everything magically worked exactly the way we wanted it to work. Um, so this is, you know, I would say this is probably um, among the properties that you can have in a control that's going to be the one that takes you to the promised land when you are really stuck more often than not. A um, few more questions in the chat. So one question here is what advice would you give to someone is interested in learning to use and read Kumu mapping, um, but is still at the very elementary stage of building loops and doesn't know how to build maps, uh, connect them to spreadsheets, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I think once you get into the topic of spreadsheets and importing your data and managing it that way, you're getting into more advanced Kumu territory. Um, so I would say um, my advice on how to do that, well, if you're particularly interested in moving from uh, a map that's built by hand into a map that is built from a spreadsheet, um, I'll clear some of these settings here and then show you a trick. Um, so right now I've got this map. This was all loaded in from a spreadsheet and not built by hand. But let's say I wanted to start, I wasn't sure how to set up the spreadsheet. You could actually come in here and just maybe add three, four or five different elements, add some test connections between them. And then what you can do is you can come into table um, and you can see this is exactly what your spreadsheet should look like. Um, so, and if I come up here into the corner, I can change, I'm looking at connections now, I can look at elements instead. Um, so you can come here and get a much better idea you know, imagine I just had a list of like five elements that I just put in. This, you could copy and paste this directly over to Excel, but the better option would be to come down here and export this to Excel. That's gonna give me a map um, in the exact Excel format I need to get the visual effect I already created. So that's my number one piece of advice from, you know, learning, you're at, you're at the stage of learning Kumu. Um, you might wanna get into a stage where you're able to build things from a spreadsheet. Um, it definitely takes some practice and some training 
um, to see, to look at a spreadsheet, to set it up and imagine in your head, okay, this is what it's going to look like when it's all circles and lines on the map. Uh, it took me a long time to get to a place where I can kind of intuitively look at a spreadsheet and in my head, I see the map. Um, that just takes time and practice, but definitely a great way to get started is to build by hand and export to Excel so you have an example of what to look at, what to look at and what to work from. Um, are we planning on creating a controls dashboard that doesn't require coding is another question here from the chat. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, we have the basic one set up here. If you come to, um, so you've got your settings panel, open that up, come to more options and add custom control. This is what we've got right now for code free controls. Um, this only does have a few basic options. They're the most common options. So you can accomplish a lot of things with just these ones. Um, but uh, I think in the future, we would like to expand this more. It's kind of a balance between, um, you know, how can you pack more powerful features in here so that people can just kind of customize their controls, even get really advanced controls going with no knowledge of the coding. Um, how can we kind of make that more possible without making this interface like just a huge scrolling box that goes on forever and there's like a billion options that you want to customize. Um, and so for a new user coming into that, it's like we don't want it to overwhelm them when they're just trying to add their first basic control. Um, so it's just, you know, kind of a balancing act and we're experimenting with that all the time. Um, we've been working with this for a while. I, I do like this setup that we have now, but I think maybe it could use, um, like maybe we could bring in uh, this kind of thing from the, you know, this, this filter selector. So we could create a selector builder where you can select, you can basically use this to set your target property. Um, uh, I think that would be a kind of a useful addition. So. Stuff like that is what we're thinking about as we move forward with those interfaces. Um, let's see. We have something here about changing variables in the table. Um, not sure, Ian, about that question about table. Definitely email me after this. Um, I've got like one or two more things I want to cover about controls, and we're right up at the top of the hour now. Um, that might be an individual case with your map, but yeah, help with, happy to help with that if you can send a message to support at kumu.io. Um, so the last control I wanted to show before we jump off is it's like the mother of all controls. It's the newest one and it, it's something that I haven't even fully experimented with yet, um, but it's super powerful. So it's called a view toggle control and it basically lets you switch entirely between views. Whereas these, uh, these controls here are just kind of like applying different um, view settings. Like if I want, you know, I could set up a view setting that says, um, I could come in here to filter and I could set up a filter that says only show elements that, you know, have that advocate for the local environment tag. Um, these are a shortcut to just creating those individual rules inside of your view. But if you want to change the entire view, like let's say you want to change the colors. I have two color schemes here. I could color by um, one field or a different field. That's something that's not supported by any individual control, but you can define, and this right now is only available in the code. So I'll jump right in there. You can define your entire separate view. So in here, I have all of the code for an individual view. Uh, and I'll just focus on this rule right now. It's coloring all elements by the country field, or no, here it is. It's coloring all elements by the element type field. And then I have another view defined here where it's coloring, let's see here. Uh, it's coloring all elements by the countries field. So I can click on this control. Let's say I wanna focus on you know a categories view or a countries view. Right now I can filter by category I've got my control at the top to help me do that. Um, but if I want to go to a country's view, now we've got all these elements colored by country and my control changed so I can filter my country. Um, so this control is, I think, the number one most complex feature of Kumu because it wraps up like 10 different complex features, features that are complex in their own right and puts them all in one pile and lets you control all of them from one place. Um, so this is another area where we're working on some more examples and documentations and videos to help you get a handle on this. I think there are some really simple use cases like 
switching from one color scheme to the next that are something that people actually pretty commonly want to do. Um, so we want to make that stuff possible without requiring you to sort of have the absolute 100% expert level knowledge of everything that Kumu has to offer just to be able to change between two different color schemes. Um, so that's kind of where we're going with the future of uh, controls and helping you learn those. Um, but just wanted to show that one because it's super cool. There's one more example here. So this person has uh, a, it's called a partial view, um, a partial view control setup to change the showcase and add a shadow to elements that are in showcase. Um, and it's got a bunch of different options here. They all follow that same pattern where they apply a showcase setting and then they change the shadow size for one of the element types. So as I click here, um, you can imagine this is like a self-contained presentation where I, you can see the shadows are changing. Now these ones out of showcase no longer have shadows. This big shadow I think is going to disappear in the next one. So that shadow goes away and the showcase changes. Um, so you can have these controls where you change multiple different high level settings about the view all in one click. Um, and this, this stuff just like blows my mind. I don't even know how this works under the hood at all, but it's something super cool that I really want to experiment with in the future. Uh, and of course, leave documentation in my trail so that people can follow along and use it in their own ways. Um, still looking, if anybody has ideas for, um, you know, common things like changing from one color scheme to the next, uh, stuff like that that they've always wanted to do but never been able to figure out, uh, definitely shoot them my way and I can come up with some different examples of how to achieve that. You can achieve, you know, pretty much anything with this partial view control. Um, so definitely the most complex thing in Kumu, but by far the most powerful. Um, so that is where I will, I think, leave off. Um, I'm definitely free to stay on a little longer. It's 12.03 now. I know we plan to go just until noon. Um, well, 11 a.m. PDT, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to stay on if anyone has any extra questions about controls in general. Um, again, uh, I think my last maybe final note that I'll leave you with is just come into here to this controls document. This is going to be your entry point um, to everything there is to know about controls. Um, and there's a lot of information here. Um, but once you can kind of get a grip on some of this stuff and, and get used to how some of it works, um, you can really take a lot of your maps to the next level in terms of making them readable and easy for your readers and your audiences to navigate, um, even if you're not there in the room to kind of personally guide them through uh, what they should be looking at and kind of what insights are there to draw out.